Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. We're going to go over a chest CT on a fairly young individual, about 31 years old. And this is a chest CT here, and I'm going to give you a little peek at the abdomen as well. Okay, so first get a general idea of what things you see that look like they may be abnormal. Focus on the chest here first. Okay, take a look there. Something there maybe. Okay, and if you look here, do you see something wrong? This looks abnormal right here, doesn't it? Because you have the aorta, you know this is a pulmonary artery here. Just the top of it there. Right and left main stem bronchi, SVC, descending aorta. What is this? Well, if you don't have an answer for it, you have to worry about it. Now down here, we're seeing more of what we'd expect for the esophagus, right? And this is the azicus vein. Azicus vein, very important little vein that we talk a lot about and we encounter frequently. So it's, it's an important structure to know for a variety of reasons, normal variants and abnormalities that can cause it to become enlarged. So the azagous vein comes up from the abdomen here and then it loops over the right main stem bronchus and joins the SVC. And remember that is what we see on a chest radiograph causing the azagous fissure, for example, when it hooks over the IVC or over the right main stem bronchus. So let's look here. Here you can see that. Here you can see that vessel kind of a little bit coursing up like that. And then it reaches this height and then look what it does. It goes forward, it goes forward and here's the right main stem bronchus, right? right here, and here it is going over the right main stem bronchus, and then it joins the SVC, and the SVC empties into the right atrium, as does the IVC, which comes up through the liver. See that? And why does it have this appearance? You have contrast of pacified blood from above coming into the right atrium. You have much less intensely in enhanced blood coming th from the IVC up into the right ventral, right atrium here. And so that's where you have this admixture type of process. Okay. So important to be very comfortable with that azagous vein, azagous vein. One of my very favorite veins. Let's see what you can see here. It's a little hard on this, in this case, but it's there, but you see it really quite well on the axial image. Okay, and all of that is by way of emphasizing the importance of knowing what is normal in the mediastinum so that when something's abnormal, you can say that it is abnormal, it doesn't belong there. What level are we at here? Well, you might say the level of the aortic arch, but it's kind of a little bit below that. This is the level of the carina. You should be able to see that. So even though you're not seeing the carina itself, an arrow here or an uh, image of this sort, and you were to be asked at what level are we here, the level of the carina, because it's just starting to branch into right and left main stem bronchi. You could also say it's the level of the arch of the azagous vein. But this is something that is more reliably identifiable from study to study, and therefore I think that's probably a little bit better way to, to describe it, but you'll develop your own terminology uh, and preferences in those areas. I think you're all very comfortable with the main pulmonary artery and right and left pulmonary arteries. So there's something abnormal here. What's this? The descending aorta. What's this? The azagous vein. Azagous vein. Azagous vein. Okay. What other abnormalities do you see here? This and this. 
What is it? Bilateral pleural effusions. They use the term effusion very generically. Technically, an effusion is a watery fluid, but if it's pus or it's blood, it's still generically referred to as an, an effusion until uh, someone identifies uh, exactly what it is. Seem to have something down here too, not sure what that is, if that indicates there's some blood in there or not, possibly. Okay, so we have this mass in the mediastinum. Let's look through the lungs. Besides the pleural fluid, what else do we have? Really nothing. The one thing we do have, which is really trivial, but it still warrants mentioning, that's atelectasis. Here you have atelectasis in the left lower lobe. What's causing it? Well, it's obvious it's going to be this pleural effusion, and you almost always see some degree of atelectasis with pleural effusions of any sort. And actually, this is there's surprisingly little on the right side for the amount of pleural fluid there. But it's variable, and it depends also on how well the person can inspire, how healthy and vigorous they are to take in a good inspiration, bring those diaphragms very low, and open up the lower lobes. Someone who's frail and weak and uh, has a low blood pressure, uh, is just barely ventilating, is going to get a lot more atelectasis. Okay, so in summary, we have this mass. Where would you say it's located? It's in the superior mediastinum, and it's posterior to the trachea and, and the distal trachea and the level of the carina, and it abuts the right and left main stem bronchi. So it's a mass. Could, be, could it be arising from the esophagus? This is esophagus here. And then you run into that mass. And then you see esophagus here. It could be, but I would expect that if there really were that big a mass in the esophagus, there'd be some accumulation of fluid in the esophagus above that level. OK. So we have that mass in the superior mediastinum. What's the differential diagnosis for it? Lymphoma is one. Any time you have adenopathy, uh, bronchogenic carcinoma, uh, tuberculosis, but it usually would not be in that retrotracheal posterior location. It would be multiple locations. It wouldn't tend to situate itself just there. Okay, so now let's look in the abdomen. Even though we're not an abdomen, but the two are very closely and importantly related. How would you describe this abnormality? How would you describe it? Think about it for a moment. Say it to yourself. Practice. What are you going to say? Start out very generically. There's a mass in the abdomen. How's that for generic, non-committal? Where on the abdomen? It's retroperitoneal. How do you know? It's periaortic. You can see it's enveloping the aorta. So there's a large periaortic retroperitoneal mass extending to the left and right of midline and elevating the aorta, displacing it away from the vertebra. What's the mass look like? Is it lots of little masses or is it confluent? It's a confluent mass. It's a confluent mass in the retroperitoneum enveloping the abdominal aorta. Where else do you see abnormalities? Well, you see some, looks like the collecting systems are a little dilated, and that's probably because there are ureters on both sides. Here's the right ureter, for example. This ureter on the right side is coursing at least against this mass, if not partially into it. You see the mass goes all the way down into the pelvis. Extra peritoneal enveloping vessels. Okay. Interesting, there's some air in there, huh? 
Hmm, a little bit of air in there. Okay. I'm going to put that aside for the moment. Look at the spleen. There's a mass in the spleen, a low attenuation mass in the spleen. There's another one. There's another one. How do you describe that? Multiple splenic masses. Okay, multiple splenic masses. A diagnosis coming to mind? Should be. Lymphoma. Lymphoma, this is a classic, typical appearance for lymphoma. There are other neoplasms, testicular, for example, that can give you a lot of retroperitoneal adenopathy. But this confluent appearance, particularly with, lymph with splenic involvement, is pretty typical for lymphoma, which in this way is a good thing because lymphoma, relatively speaking, is treatable and sometimes curable. Now this air is bothering me, but I think it's right at the level or near the level of the of the, the disc space, and sometimes you get some disc desiccation and gas vacuum type of effect with a little bit of gas in a portion of the disc. So lacking a better explanation at this point, I'm going with that. Not sure. That's real radiology. Not being sure all the time. Okay. So lymphoma is a good bet. Lymphoma can be treated with chemotherapy and sometimes will just disappear. It doesn't always mean it's cured, but it'll often go away. Look right here. What area is that? It's the porta hepatis. And we have something abnormal there. Did you see it? So here you have, looks like duodenum. Here's pancreatic head. And you have this big thing here. Let's see, is that duodenum itself? No, no, it's not. So you have this mass right here. That's my son. My son and daughter are home from college. So here you have this mass here. And let's see, is it a, it's next to the pancreas? So where would you describe this? This is in the porta hepatis. This is in the porta hepatis region, or it's close to the porta hepatis, okay, which is this general area here, like the hilum of the liver, I often say. Okay, lastly, where's the last space that's involved? We've described periaortic retroperitoneal, but there's an important area to be aware of. It's one of those areas, if you don't think of it, you won't look there. And that's behind the crura of the diaphragms. This is retrocrural. And nodes there are particularly small, usually less than a half a centimeter in diameter. So if you see any significant node in that area, you have to worry. Never mind the fact that if you have a big mass like this, a relatively large mass, that's going to be adenopathy too. So, an unusual case of lymphoma in terms of the how severe and extended the findings are, but at the same time showing some typical findings of lymphoma. <laughs> My son. Uh, so, that's it. <laughs>